Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, a discussion about a new six-part PBS series with some important connections to the Gem State. We'll take you behind the scenes of a documentary on Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique with the cinematographer and the producer, and the man who's devoting his life to saving the park. They all live in Idaho. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. For two years, a film team followed wildlife and researchers in an amazing park in Mozambique, a park that was very nearly decimated in a brutal 15-year-long civil war. Today, it's rebounding, thanks to a joint partnership between Idaho philanthropist Greg Carr and the Mozambican government. The story is extraordinary, as is the tale of the filming itself. And here to talk about it all is Greg Carr, the president of the Gorongosa Restoration Project, Bob Poole, the cinematographer and host of the series, and James Byrne, the producer of the documentary. Now, all three men live in Idaho when they're not traveling the world, so it's great we can corral them all in one place for this discussion, which is also being watched by a live studio audience. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Marcia. Thanks. Great, great to great have to you here. here. First to you, Greg, this uh, series is the culmination of mm. many years of planning, yeah. hopes. You know, in, in 2004 is the first time I saw Gorongosa, okay. and at the time, I from the air, I couldn't see a single animal. I never would have dreamed that, fast forward 12 years later, and PBS is making a six hour series for the whole world, and there's thousands of animals. So it's just, I, I could never have dreamed any of this. Now, let's, let's uh, recapitulate a little bit and talk about the Idaho connection. You guys knew each other from Ketchum. Bob and I live nearby. Um, and I knew Bob, I knew that he was a National Geographic cinematographer, we were buddies, but I was in Africa in Gorongosa Park one day in January of 2008, and he walks up, and I didn't know, <laughs> Bob, what are you doing here? <laughs> but he was sent with James yeah. by National Geographic to make a film about the place where I was working. We had been together in Sudan, James and I, and uh, Somewhere along the line, National Geographic said, hey, you guys are over there. Why don't you go down and check out this Gorongosa? Yeah. So uh, we did. We flew down, and there was Greg. <laughs> <laughs> As happens. So how would you both get on the, the PBS gig came out of the fact that you'd spent so much time already in Gorongosa on the National Geographic projects? Yes. Actually, by then, um, we had done quite a lot of uh, work in Gorongosa. I'd really fallen in love with the park. And um, Beth Hoppy from PBS had, had seen the film War Elephants, and she said, yes, it would be great to do a sort of uh, longer, m more in-depth look at the work being done in the park and watch the recovery happen and, and take a deep look at the science, the real science that was mm -hmm. taking place there. Well, let me ask you, Greg, um, you've uh, had many other documentarians come through. There's been several films made on Gorongosa. Yeah. Why were you interested in having uh, this six-part series made? You know, I don't think there's anybody in the world better than the combination of PBS and National Geographic for quality programming, for caring about education, and for dedicating two years. I mean, you think about how much television is made today, and it's just, you know, one hour pumping things out each week. These guys spent two and a half years of their life living inside the park. A lot of different film companies around the world would have wanted to do that, but we only allowed National Geographic and PBS. And what we gave them is something that I don't know if any other national park has ever given a film crew, which is complete access, backstage pass, so to speak. They could film at night, they could go off the roads, they could go inside private meetings that our rangers were having. And that kind of transparency, I don't think anyone's ever seen the inside of a national park. And we just, we trusted them as good people and we said, film anything you want. Why? Well, it's important that this story is told because 
Gorongosa is one example of something happening all over the world today, which is what we're losing habitats, and rainforests are disappearing, cities grow, suburbs grow, natural areas get smaller. We have an extinction crisis on this planet. When, when, a, when a forest disappears, anything that lives there disappears. If that's the only place it lives, then it goes extinct. Gorongosa is a success story. We're restoring a national park. We need to bring some hope to people who only hear sad stories. We need people to realize, you know what, you can restore a natural area, and we want this story told. But the openness, the transparency, why was that important to you? Well, it's an unusual situation to have a private sector entity team with the government to restore a national park. And there's a lot of trust involved between the Mozambican government and my foundation. And we want everybody to know what's going on. We don't just work inside the national park. In fact, we spend an equal amount of money outside the park. We help farmers. We, we do health care. This combination of doing human development and conservation at the same time and showing the world that it can be done, that you don't have to choose one or the other, like, well, you know, you're going to choose people, you're going to choose animals, that's a silly choice. We can restore habitats and actually have national parks benefit people. We want this model out there. James, uh, can you explain uh, the relationship between PBS and National Geographic on this project? Yeah, it's very simple. PBS is taking the program in the United States and National Geographic Channels International is taking it everywhere else in the world. But if I go back, go back to a question you asked Greg in terms of, you know, why PBS, why that combination? Bill Gardner, who's a VP at uh, PBS in Washington, D.C., came to visit Gorongosa because he was scouting for the Ed Wilson biography film. Um, and Bill sat there and kind of realized the potential of doing what he called a longitudinal series. Um, you know, I'd really like to track the evolution of this project over, mm -hmm. over the course of a couple of years. I think he originally started with 10 years, but we had to scale it back to two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at, that was a, a period that was long enough to be able to track human characters and animal characters over time and really see the progress of the, mm -hmm. um, of the, of the restoration project. You know, the other thing that impressed me about them, about Bill as well, was that he he didn't, um, you know, shirk from, you know, some of the difficult kind of conservation stories that appear in the series. You know, in this first episode, we've got snared lions, you know, we've got a civil war happening, we've deforestation on the mountain, we have yeah. elephants attacking, you know, human villages. You know, and these are the stories that don't often get shown in do nature documentaries, particularly set yeah. in Africa. You know, there's a sort of a fantasy version of Africa that's portrayed in a lot of these nature documentaries. And Bill said, you know, what we want to show what's really going on. And I was, I was impressed with that, with that desire. I shared that desire. So did Bob. We worked on a lot of programs together. And we became, I think, increasingly uncomfortable with the fact that humans were being framed out of a lot of these stories. Mm. And the other thing I think that, was, that, that, that really got me excited and Bob got, got excited about too was, was the fact that at the beginning they said, you know what, we don't need you guys to pre-script this. Just go there, be there, and film what happens. And, you know, you don't get that kind of freedom anymore. Usually you're sent out, you have to have... Yeah, pretty good idea of what you're going to come back with by before you go out. And in this particular case, we mm -hmm. didn't. Bill just said, I don't need shooting scripts. I don't need anything from you. Just go there and follow what happens. And, you know, that's, that's how documentaries used to be made in the old days. <laughs> but uh, they're mm -hmm. becoming less so now because there's less money, there's less time, all of these factors. So to me, that was really impressive. The idea that we didn't have to script anything, produce anything, shape mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. Everything that happened really happened. And I think that's... You see, and I had to trust these guys because, first of all, I'm a guest in Mozambique myself. And the government of Mozambique has trusted me to help restore their national park. Now I'm bringing in an international film crew that's going to see everything. They're going to see things go wrong. They're going to... One day, elephants went out of the park and were eating somebody's farm. You know, then we have Mozambican rangers arresting Mozambican poachers. And I'm allowing an international film crew to see all of this. It could potentially be embarrassing to Mozambique. But I trusted the integrity of these guys to tell the truth. And at the end of the day, I knew that we were winning, that we were restoring this park. Mozambicans were benefiting. And I thought, you know what, let's tell the story, warts and all, because there's a lot more good than bad going on. And, and they pulled it off. Bob, you've, you had already spent quite a bit of time in Gorongosa. Um, you were looking at spending, you know, two more years of your life associated uh, with this documentary series. What, what brought you back? 
what, what drove you to say yes? Um, I never wanted to leave once <laughs> I got there. <laughs> I, I, uh, seriously, I fell in love with Gorongosa from the first assignment there um, back in 2008. I was there uh, to watch uh, the wildlife recover. Mm -hmm. It was a story that um, I just felt really connected with, but also uh, um, one that I just wanted to keep being a part of. And immersing myself for two years in the park was just quite not long enough. I mean, I, I'd gladly go back and spend another two years right now. So um, You're not only the cinematographer, you're the host. What was that like to drop into that role or to assume it? Well, you know, I, um, it's, uh, it's pretty new to me, um, doing the, uh, hosting a series, uh, presenting like that. But um, what I like about it is that I get to share my passion for the place and hopefully um, uh, encourage others to sort of get on board and, and feel that too. Uh, I really found that I enjoyed it, um, getting, my, getting my message out. And, and the there's another really important point that I want to make here. So we have the rangers and scientists trying to save the national park, and we have filmmakers watching, but there's something else going on. Bob and the media team actually helped in the conservation work. So mm -hmm. they're filming lion behavior that the scientists are glad to see, or, or their cameras they put up at night are finding species in places we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Now you're actually seeing the media merge and become part of the conservation process, and I think mm -hmm. that's innovative mm -hmm. in Gorongosa. And we were also able um, to do things that hadn't been done, for instance, um, explore parts of the park that, that no one had taken a close look at yet. Um, we brought in a boat, which then got used by the rangers. Uh, we, we, we explored uncharted territory on the north of the lake in the dry season. We were probably mm -hmm. the first vehicle to have ever gotten back in there, and that yeah. changes the way that um, anti-poaching can be done. We, we found routes into places, and we yeah. were able to do that because we had this long-term project going yeah, yeah. on. So it was less a sort of a, you know, a, a process whereby we were filming. We, we truly sort of became enmeshed with, with all the work that was going on and became part of the team. So then does it become hard when you do see something that's a little <laughs> you know, difficult to pull yourself apart and say, you know, I've got to essentially report on this when you're part of the family? Because there's generally a little bit more of a line you know. Well, yes and no, but I, I think the, the benefits actually outweigh the sort of maybe any, any any wrestling we would have had with it because then we, 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 we gained the trust of all of the scientists in particular. You know, mm -hmm. oftentimes as, as people who make TV, we find that when we're working with scientists and scientists in the audience will, <laughs> will sympathize with this. You know, there's a little bit of a mistrust between, you know, media and science. And scientists are never sure that the media is going to portray them or their work in, a, you know, in the right way, etc. And so it takes time to build that trust. And over the course of the, the two-year project, very, very quickly actually we did. And I had absolutely no input on the edit. So there's a point in the series where the Civil War breaks out again. Bob has to take off. And he talks about that. Now, I may be thinking, gee, I kind of wish he wouldn't talk about the war because that could be bad for tourism. <laughs> but I have no input into the final edit. And mm -hmm. what you see in this six-hour series mm -hmm. is what happened. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the dangers associated with this. Um, was there ever a point where you thought, oh, this isn't going to come together? Yeah, I mean, there was a couple of points. You know, I mean, almost the first week when we started filming in October 2012, the, the conflict began. And the last week of filming in August 2014, the conflict ended. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of like it paralleled our filming kind of perfectly. You know, Greg mm -hmm. wrestled with it. But of course, as a producer, this is a great storyline. <laughs> You know, and it's all about a, a hero trying to overcome obstacles. And, of course, this is a huge obstacle that, you know, our hero has to overcome. Um, and, yeah, so there was a couple of times during the project when, mm -hmm. you know, we had to stop filming. It was not safe to continue. It, it, the, on the other flip side of it is we had the place totally to ourselves. And from a, for filmmaking, that's fantastic because you never had anybody disturbing your... Yeah. your shots or yeah. you know the 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 long times you could stake out and wait for animals in in a place where normally there might be cars passing by and we were pretty there's another piece of the story too i have about 400 employees and about half of them are from one political party and half from the other that are having this conflict and occasionally the bullets fly so gorongosa actually in the center of the country is seen as a place of peace we were safe 
And going around with a Gore and Gosa Park label on your car was almost like having a red cross on your car because we're seeing, it's like, we're the neutral guys. We're, we're protecting the national treasure, which is this park. And it was a wonderful example of where you could find a, a neutral space. Let's talk about lions. Well, lions are the thread through this series. Why? Well, I think nothing could symbolize the rebirth of Gorongosa more than lions. I mean, Gorongosa was known for huge prides of lions. And they reckon there was something like 500 lions in the Gorongosa ecosystem before all the trouble. And brought back to single digits, it's, you know, it's a comeback like nothing else. And besides, everybody loves lions. Lions need space. They need a lot of space. They're a very wide-ranging animal. I mean, a male lion could have a territory that could be 50, 60 kilometers. If you've got multiple prides, you're talking about a huge area of wilderness that they need. So if you save lions, you're saving the wilderness. You're saving everything else mm -hmm. that's in there. There was a really interesting international news story tie-in to all this because mm. Cecil the lion was, was killed and, 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 you know, at the same time now you have this series where the importance of lions is throughout the six parts. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's good. I, you know, a lot of my peers and people I talk to, you know, I think everybody has heard of the elephant ivory crisis. There's a few, you know, the rhino horn crisis. There's a few things that make the headlines. But I, most people I speak to don't actually realize lions are in crisis. They really are 20 years away from extinction. So, you know, I think the Cecil the Lion yeah. in incident when it happened, I was delighted because it didn't just shine a light on, you know, trophy hunting, which, you know, in theory is, could be a positive force for conservation, but it's also throwing a light, I think, on the, on the fact that lions are in, really in big trouble. And we can't afford to lose the number that are being lost to trophy hunting. But, you know, what I think we had the opportunity to do in the series is, is tell the, the other side, of the, well, the, the, another part of that story, which people don't often hear about, which is illegal snaring, you know, which is just much more mundane, but much more insidious, really. I want to talk about the experience of being up close and filming a line, getting the shots, making sure you get the shots and making sure you stay safe. Uh, Actually, lions, uh, funny enough, I, 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 so I grew up in Africa um, and I've been around lions since I can remember. And I, you, you, it's funny because you don't actually have a fear for lions after a while. Uh, lions actually will run from humans uh, almost always. But then there's Gorongosa and Gorongosa lions. And the thing about Gorongosa is it's this big wilderness, right? There's a road network of tracks that occupies, what, 10% of the mm -hmm. park. And f the tracks are far apart. And you go out there, you don't know where you're going. You're going to be lost for a long time. But, but um, I just even lost some more tourists. <laughs> no, 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 but, they, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but that's also to me the beauty of the place. Yeah. That's why I would want to go there. Yeah. But anyway, um, but these lions. So I had built this the first time I ran into this one incredible male lion that that uh, becomes quite a character in our series. I um, was just treating him like you know lions that I was used to, and uh, he had really not seen humans before. And I came in. Too quickly, too close, mm. too exposed, and uh, he gave me quite a fright. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the techniques that you use to film uh, a lion? You've got to uh, be lowered down, right? Your camera yes, needs to be lowered? Yes. Um, actually, James encouraged me to build a, a, a find a way to get the camera low enough that we could see lions on their, on their you know, eye level or lower. And um, I put a lot of thought into it, but I came up with a thing that I could quickly um, flip upside down on my car that put the camera at a very low angle. But it also mm -hmm. put me quite in an <laughs> exposed position mm -hmm. outside the car. So uh, later on, after I had my experience with this lion, I, I, I started putting a veil, uh, just a, uh, a net, a mm -hmm. camouflage net down that I could see out of, but he, he wouldn't be able to see me so clearly through. Mm -hmm. It was just a veil. Let's talk about uh, filming elephants. Uh, elephants are almost part of your family. In a way, your sister is an international expert on elephants, and she's featured in this documentary. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you'd had some kind of hairy experiences with elephants uh, in the past, or at least an elephant that kind of char that charged your your vehicle. We uh, we were coming home in the dark, and uh, elephants had knocked a tree down across the road as they do, and and I had disturbed them because I had to bash through the forest with my lights on to get 
around. And while that, while we were sort of coming out of that, we we uh, we ran into an elephant that was pretty upset by us. And so we had a pretty terrifying encounter that ended up. We we all were fine, and but luckily, <laughs> <laughs> luckily the car had been. Perf Look, other than charging mm. elephants, mm. lions, rogue soldiers, and getting hopelessly lost, it's I can assure you, <laughs> <laughs> nothing will go wrong. Mm. The food's great. Um, <laughs> yes, we have a nice restaurant and a swimming pool <laughs> and a gift shop, and you can spend all your time in the gift shop. <laughs> Now, James is the producer. Uh, you know, you also wrote several episodes, so you have to wade through all this footage yeah. and find the themes, find the threads, find the stories. Yeah, that's that was definitely challenging because it would have been safer to go out at the beginning with with storylines, with with sort of things pre-scripted, because then at least you've got that to lean on. And while it's while it's uh, immensely liberating to be able to go out and not have to do that, it's also terrifying because then you you end up with hundreds of hours of footage at the end, and you go, how do I, you know, make a make an hour that seems like it's all it all kind of fits together and it flows and it develops and all those kinds of things. So the edit the editing on this one was really challenging. It took a while. It took twice as long in the edit room as I expected it would. You filmed an animal swap. This is an example. Uh, this animal swap of where the transparency that you mentioned ca comes into play. During the, the uh, capture of the eland and the transport of them, some of them died. Uh, why was it important to include that? And I think it's important to show people, you know, this is the reality of, of conservation, you know, in, 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 in modern Africa. You know, it, it's not easy to move wild animals, you know, without sedatives and all the rest of it. There are pure, wild, big animals, and you're putting them in trucks. But it has to be done if, if, if they're going to survive, if the species is going to survive. And, and I would add that conservation is for pragmatists. An, an ideological purist is not going to last very long in a difficult, complicated situation like Gorongosa. In the end, I think we're winning, but day to day, things go wrong. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight the fact that this documentary series is not just about large animals. Some of my favorite scenes actually are with very, very small uh, creatures. I think, um, we, you know, the, the reason we have some of these stories is in the series is purely because of the ensemble of scientists that have gathered in Gorongosa, you know. Um, I think a lot of scientists sort of see Gorongosa as a huge opportunity to kind of study what happens to an ecosystem you know, when, when, the, when, the, when the deck is shuffled. So we really depend on those scientists to be, to communicate to us and then allow us to communicate to the general audience, you know. And that's another Idaho connection because there are many yeah. researchers <coughs> from Idaho, whether it's University yeah. of Idaho or you've just signed a new agreement with Boise State University and yeah. the Intermountain Bird Observatory. There's just going to be this cross-pollination, for want yeah. of a better word, between uh, our researchers going to Gorongosa and in turn Mozambicans coming here. Yeah. We have here at Boise State University the first Mozambican woman to get advanced training in this country in uh, studying birds. So there's going to be students going both directions. And we're going to do this for another 20 or 30 years. We have a goal of identifying every species in the park that you can see with the naked eye. No national park in the entire world has ever done this. It'll take us a generation. We don't know what we'll find. We may find 50, 60, 70,000 different species. I understand that a species has been found and named after you. I have an ant. Uh, <laughs> so so the, the Harvard team showed up and in the three weeks found 200 different ant species in Gorongosa, of which 20 had never been seen by a scientist before. And one of the ants is named after me. It's Carr. I think it's a handsome ant, but people, <laughs> some people have made fun of it, and they say <laughs> that it's not an attractive ant, but you know, I personally love it. Does it Isn't sting? It? Does it sting? <laughs> it, it's an ant that eats spider eggs for a living, and considering the fact that my mom does not like spiders, I think that this ant is virtuous. <laughs> I'd like the two of you who worked on the production to tell me how it has changed you, in what ways it has changed you, Bob? Well, 
to be a part of a team um, is so amazing for me. I, I had always sort of dropped in on other projects and had the privilege of filming for a month or so and then had to leave. And in this case, um, to be accepted uh, by the scientists and the rangers and the administration and, and all t as friends together working for one common goal was um, an extraordinary experience. And, uh, and, and um, it's uh, just something that I know I'll, I'll now always be part of as long as I'm around uh, this, this amazing project. And James? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's, I probably share this with almost everybody else on the team. It's just to sort of be part of this incredibly, yes, it's difficult, it's complicated, but, you know, amazingly inspirational and, um, you know, to, to spend day by day with people like Paula and Joyce and Peter and Rui and Pedro and all these guys. I mean, it is difficult, difficult work. I mean, it is, it's, we've got a great restaurant, I know that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's incredibly hard work. I mean, you, 16 hour days in the, in, the, in, the, yeah. in, the, uh, in the dry season, it can get, you know, 120 mm. degrees out there. Maybe not 120, 110. Um, mm. And you just see people doing it day after day after day after day without complaining and with a smile on their faces because they... We love it. Because they love it and they believe in the, not just in the, in the idea of, of, of it happening in this particular place, but they're almost fighting for the idea that it can be done yes. anywhere. You know, and that's amazing to be If we said Gorongosa, we have shown that you could save any place on earth. And we are a team of people with a mission. And there's nothing in life that will make you happier than to have a purpose. Something happens when you go to Africa for the first time, if, if you're an American or a European. You get a funny feeling, because we all come from Africa. When we save Gorongosa, we're actually saving the cradle of our species. And it just kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck that this really matters. Because when we save Gorongosa, we're looking into our deep past, but we're also looking into our future of our planet if we show that we will protect habitats, we'll fight for nature, and this is gonna be a rough century for the planet, but I'm an optimist and we can leave it better than we found it. Well, thank you. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to talk with me, to our audience here. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank my guests, Greg Carr, Bob Poole, and James Byrne, all of whom live in Idaho but are dedicated to helping restore one of the most unique places on Earth, Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. My thanks, too, to our audience here in Studio A at Idaho Public Television and to the many people who worked on this program. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.